Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and organizers of this symposium, dear family and friends of Professor Dushka Dragoon, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here in the Langenbeck Virchow House in Berlin and also in the virtual space of the second day uh, at the, uh, of the 10th anniversary of our clinician scientist program in loving memory of Dushka Dragoon. Dushka was not only a pioneer in the establishment of the Biomedical Innovation Academy and its paradigmatic clinician scientist programs, indeed she was a pioneer in the establishment of our entire institution, the Berlin Institute of Health, a government-funded research institute dedicated to the art and the science of translation in medicine. Dushka belonged to the first generation of our faculty established since 2015. She influenced so many of us in Berlin and far beyond in many other places, and this occurred in at least three important missions. As a medical doctor dedicated to patients, as an international leading scientist in her field of transplantation medicine, and as the founder of our Translational Academy, the Biomedical Innovation Academy, BIA. Her life, however, was far too short, and it was a traumatic and severe loss, a personal loss to so many of us that we were confronted with in the final days of the last year when she died of her progressing disease. In the search for an allegory that illustrates and explains what she really means to us, I came across this picture of the French painter Saint-Jean, a famous picture named uh, La Jardinière, the gardener girl in English, painted back in 1837. Let us read in the book In the Gardens of Impressionism what it contains and shows. Perhaps the most famous of the 19th century Lyon fleurists, so the, uh, the flower painters, Saint-Jean produced this spectacular painting in a bid for entry to the Paris Salon. The flowers and plants, including morning glory, roses, tulips, poppies, dahlias, and acanthus, are chosen for their symbolic connotations and construct a complex allegory of the transience of beauty and the permanence of art. The audience, all elements of this description, point to Dushka's life and work. The bid for entry of a great artist to the Paris Salon represents her never-ending dedication to produce the best possible results and influence the best people of her field. The variety and the beauty of the flowers painted here represent the rich contributions to so many individual careers that she has made possible and continues to make possible. Because indeed, while we are all very much aware of the transience of our existence, we all believe in the permanence of art, which is, in Dushka's case, the art of science. So where there was no way, Dushka built one, and what she built will have a persisting impact. This slide shows you an aspect of the garden that she has built, a group photo showing faculty, advisors, and trainees of the Berlin Innovation, uh, Biomedical Innovation Academy. Without any question, the BIA and its clinical scientist programs make an essential contribution to medical translation, the transfer of knowledge into health, as outlined in a very recent external evaluation of the BIA that you find online on our website. The next slide taken from Dushka's slide library shows that this contribution, the contribution of the BIA as formed by her and her team, occurs in many dimensions. 
the field of action form a bouquet of complementary activities that all contribute to and are required for strategic career building, innovative career pathways, and new models of academic innovation in medicine. These are mechanisms of support for translational careers, the first point, the second, evidence-based personnel development, the third, a curriculum reflecting all aspects of translational science, the fourth, expertise for monitoring and incentivizing, fifth, consultation of policymakers, research politics, and various national and international working parties, sixth, integration of the academy into an active ecosystem of science, and then digitization of all aspects of the academy, and most importantly, finally, shaping of the processes of innovation and actively forming new steps to accelerate translation, which also means to make translation even more sustainable, more useful for patients. In sum, we are talking of the art, her art, of innovation transfer via individualized career paths as exemplified by the BIA. Once more, this is an introduction to the second day of our symposium in loving and enduring memory of Dushka Dragoon. She established our Biomedical Innovation Academy and implanted a spirit of patient orientation, translation and innovation that we in the BIH will continue to build and expand. Natalie Huber and Ivan May, who are with me here today, are now leading the Biomedical Innovation Academy, and I am, we all are highly grateful for your dedication to this important hallmark of our institute. New generations of clinician scientists and also researchers from other disciplines will be trained in our academy to learn how science can best be made useful for those who are in need, the patients suffering, from severe diseases and also, unfortunately, very unfortunately in this respect, Dushka reminds us personally of this great need for medical innovation. The audience, I'm convinced Dushka will remain alive in her work. Her art will persist and she will continue to inspire and motivate many new generations of scientists here in Berlin and in many other places. For exactly this reason, let us now move on and do what she enjoyed most, talk about good science. And with that, I hand over to the chairs of the session five, vascular metabolic medicine, Silke Rickert Sperling and Gunnar Lachmann. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baum. I, it's a great honor for me uh, to share the following session. And I have to say that I know, I have been known Adushka for the last 10 years. I had the chance to meet her first time 10 years ago. So I was on the path following her for this clinician scientist program. And I really appreciated all the power she was pushing into that. I will share that session uh, together with Gunnar Lachmann and we have in the line of her vision prepared the session in a sense that each time uh, we are a couple of a senior person together with a clinician scientist. So uh, I take the pleasure to introduce just briefly my co-chair Gunnar Lachmann who just uh, um, finished uh, this year his clinician scientist program because he is in the department of anesthesiology and operative intensive care unit at the Charité and he performed his clinician scientist program under the lead of Claudia Spies. So the session on vascular metabolic disorders uh, is aimed that we have two couples coming up. Uh, each time we have a world leading scientific person coupled together with a clinician scientist person. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first couple. It will be Professor Benjamin O'Brien. Benjamin O'Brien started off his career partially also in Berlin. So he was trained in London, Berlin, and Sydney. And then he got a habilitation at the Charité 
and then decided to leave Berlin. I think he decided to leave Berlin in the sense that there would be a day that he would like to return to it. So he left Berlin and went on to London for his career. And after he became, finally he became a professor of uh, perioperative medicine at the research institute William Harvey in London. And we are very happy that we could recruit him back to the Charité. So since 2020, he is now the director of the Department of Cardioanesthesiology and Intensive Medicine at the Charité Centrum DHZB. And he will be joined uh, with uh, uh, Julian Friebel. Julian Friebel uh, is currently uh, doing his clinician scientist program under the lead of Ulf Landmesser in the Department of Cardiology at the Charité. And it's my first pleasure, my great pleasure to give the word now to Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, guten Morgen aus dem Wedding. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this day. After 20 years in London, I only came to Berlin a few months ago and uh, haven't had the privilege to meet Professor Dragoon. I'm very impressed by and grateful for the program she built. On a very personal level, it allows me to reconnect with our smart young colleague, Julian Friebel. Uh, Julian completed his practices year about a decade ago at my hospital in London. I shall try to set the scene by describing a clinical problem and how collaboration with clinician scientists such as Julian could foster meaningful translational research. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I receive funding relevant to the theme that we're gonna discuss, which is AF after cardiac surgery, atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery. Atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery is the most common adverse event after uh, the intervention, with about a third of the patients after coronary artery bypass grafting developing the complication. That goes up to about 40% of patients after valve surgery, and after complex or combined procedures, more than half of patients will suffer this complication. It presents very much as a perioperative problem. So out of all patients who develop AF after cardiac surgery, about 70% will have done so by post-op day four. And by the end of the first week post-op, about 94% of all patients who will develop the complication will have presented. It's by no means a benign complication. AFAX is independently associated with increased morbidity, uh, particularly increased stroke risk, with increased mortality, ICU and hospital length of stay, and subsequently cost of care. For many years, it was seen as a bit of a benign complication. Uh, it was often said to be the price of doing business. It just comes as part and parcel of uh, doing cardiac surgery. Uh, but recent research, particularly this uh, seminal paper published late last year, does show that it is anything but benign and uh, actually carries sequelae and downstream complications long after hospital discharge. And at this point, we still to this day are often failing our patients. So somebody who will have developed AF after cardiac surgery might well get discharged in sinus rhythm but will carry a significantly increased risk for stroke for the following 10 years with a hazard ratio of 1.53. Yet we do not differentiate and we do not communicate differently between patients who did develop AFAX and those that never had it. Because of the sheer size of the problem, it's also a typical marginal gains issue. And we did this work a couple of years ago, uh, looking at registries in the US and in the UK. And even small improvements in care could have a very significant impact on healthcare systems. So if for every 1% that we could reduce the incidence of AF after cardiac surgery in the US and in the UK, we would gain 3,000 more AF-free patients and we would save 15,000 fewer hospital days. So the first take-home message I'd like to present is that atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery is common and it's relevant. Yet when we did a worldwide survey uh, again two years ago, uh, looking at practice, we found practice to be very variable. Uh, it is rarely evidence-based. Uh, there are significant regional differences. There's a lot of eminence-based and uh, we'll come to a few of those numbers uh, in a minute. 
So the second take home message really is that uh, the practice is too variable and uh, what little evidence base we have is often not followed. So consequently, we came together in professional societies, the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiologists, uh, to discuss together with colleagues from electrophysiology, cardiac surgery, cardiology, uh, a best practice clinical advisory. I'm not going to focus too much on it today. If people have interest in the subject matter, there is a, a podcast that goes into a lot more detail. And if you Google SDA AF podcast, uh, you will get the link. A key part of the clinical practice advisory was this graphical representation of uh, different interventions and the evidence that comes with it. The real opportunity for improvement really uh, lies in the efforts for prevention. Uh, one interesting uh, element to it that also then starts pointing towards mechanistic uh, or cell signaling pathways that might be interrogated to better understand the pathophysiology behind this is the disciplined use of beta blockers for all patients. As you'll see here, uh, that carries class one level of evidence A or B uh, evidence for the continuation of beta blockers throughout the perioperative phase. We managed to support this with real world clinical data where at our institution uh, in London, the Bath's Heart Center, in the year of 2018, we had an overall AF rate of 37%. And this is often the only element of AF after cardiac surgery that cardiac centers measure. However, if you drill down and try and understand a bit better where we do well and where we fail patients, you will see that patients that had a beta blocker preoperatively and postoperatively had an AF rate under 30%. Patients that never received a beta blocker either pre-op or post-op, had double the rate of AFAF, AFAX. And if you want to be really sure to put a patient into AF after cardiac surgery, you would be giving him a beta blocker preoperatively and then put him into beta blocker withdrawal after the operation by not restarting. So even very simple clinical interventions uh, can actually improve care uh, significantly. Uh, this again comes from a publication around doing simple, sing, uh, simple things well. Uh, we did nothing else other than actually try and apply the evidence on clinical grounds that we have and manage through a care bundle to improve the number of patients that did receive uh, beta blockers overall, but most importantly, uh, manage to incentivize caregivers to give beta blockers much, much earlier, uh, doubling the rate of patients that receive beta blockers on post-op day one. By doing so, we actually managed to uh, decrease the incidence of AFAX uh, by a third. So clinically, the take home message definitely is that prevention is key and that we ought to be disciplined regarding beta blocker practice. In our survey, we did find that practice was very variable we also found these regional differences. And if you look at a particular intervention that is quite common in the efforts to try and prevent AFAX, uh, a lot of groups actually, or a lot of centers uh, stipulate a high normal serum potassium. So that after the operation, patients will routinely be given potassium to push the serum potassium levels uh, to super normal levels or to the higher end of normal. And because homeostasis works, patients will often require large amounts of potassium uh, to achieve this particular protocol. However, this is not uniform practice. Uh, about two thirds of centers in Europe uh, will have a protocol such as this one. It's quite common in Canada and Australia. It's largely unknown in the US. So we're in the strange uh, situation where we have some good evidence, for example, for beta blockers, and this is then often not applied in clinical practice. And we have other interventions that are widely used in clinical practice with no evidence behind them. We try to address this with a clinical trial called Tight K, uh, which has been ongoing now for about eight years with initially a pilot study. And now the main study has started recruiting. We're aiming to randomize 1,720 patients uh, over the next two and a half years in uh, 25 UK centers. And also, and this is where uh, 
uh, we're getting into the segue to Julian Friebel, we are aiming to recruit patients at Charité and the German Heart Center Berlin. The clinical side of the protocol is fairly straightforward. Uh, the intervention we want to test is the um, significance or the efficacy of maintaining high normal serum potassium levels. Uh, so patients will be randomized into two groups and the relaxed group will only be given potassium in the event that their potassium levels drop below the normal range. Whereas the other group will be treated with what is also common standard of care here in Berlin, namely aiming to keep potassiums above 4.5. Now, the, the, the bit that I want to discuss um, and, and basically lead up to Julian's research is the fact that we have a basic science arm attached to this clinical trial. So these are patients that are deeply phenotyped, um, there is a scheduled insult and we actually monitor their heart rhythm for 120 hours after the operation. And a subset of patients will actually have blood, urine and tissue taken and uh, stored. And in London, there is a program of data science, multiomics, uh, genetics and epigenetics, and particularly immunological investigation into the pathophysiology of AFACs. Now, AFAX might well be a different substrate of AF, but it will also provide a unique opportunity to further investigate pathophysiology that holds true for all forms of AF, including AF as a primary diagnosis without cardiac surgery. Another peculiarity or opportunity for AF after cardiac surgery is that the surgical intervention allows for tissue sampling. Overall, it is true that AF begets AF, and it's very interesting to see how early ion channel behaviors change after the first episode of AF. Cell signaling pathways uh, get altered. And there are very surprisingly early structural changes to the actual um, cellular structure of the atria. Undoubtedly, there is a significant element of inflammation. And this is where Julian and I are hoping to then work together in the future to test some of the hypotheses and some of the insights that he has gained through his work as a junior clinician scientist uh, to develop a strand of research that harnesses the opportunity, the research opportunity that cardiac surgery provides. This has been done in other areas. We are working together with kidney doctors uh, because the scheduled major insult that is cardiac surgery and the deep knowledge that we have about the patient cohorts uh, allows a better investigation of the mechanisms of acute kidney injury. Inflammation research has long been part and parcel of research into the perioperative phase of cardiac surgery. And uh, we would like to start a strand of work looking into atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery as a platform from which one might gain insights into AF as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, O'Brien. I think we will have questions uh, after. Thank you so much, O'Brien. We will have the questions uh, after the second talk now. So I would be happy uh, if uh, Julian uh, Friebel could follow. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction and the opportunity to discuss our data and our study outline at this meeting. We just heard about the clinical significance of atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery. It, it was somehow surprising for me to see how many overlaps become evident when we had a discussion with Ben in advance about this topic. I'm working at the Department of Cardiology in Steglitz and therefore would like to focus on the cardiologist's point of view. Atrial fibrillation has a very high prevalence, you have a very high lifetime risk, and there's a clear age dependency. Therefore, atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained arrhythmia. And besides coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation belongs to your everyday business at the cardiology department. As you can see here, we're expecting a significant increasing number of patients during the next decades. This is associated with an impaired quality of life, development of heart failure, hospitalizations, and what does not vary in this point to atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery, which has been outlined by Ben, you will find a significant increase in mortality and thrombotic complications, especially strokes. 
we know so far that atrial fibrillation is a cardiovascular risk-driven disease. And as shown here, it is, it is all about inflammation. Cardiac inflammation is a presumed underlying cause of the electrical and structural remodeling of the atrium that is associated with the onset of atrial fibrillation. Atrial myopathy that develops over a longer period is the result of a combination of factors that lead to electrical and structural remodeling in the atrium. The left atrium is enlarged, fibrotic and non-compliant, potentially because the predisposing disorder leads to an expansion of epicardial tissue, which transmit pro-inflammatory mediators to the underlying left atrium. With aging, inflammation, atrial stretch from volume and pressure overload and oxidative stress, atria may be at risk of developing atrial myopathy. At this stage, clinical atrial myopathy is not detectable. One's fibrosis and various ways of uh, atrial remodeling, including structural, electrophysiological, and autonomic remodeling, uh, have taken place. Atrial myopathy is established and becomes detectable. At this stage, the patient remains asymptomatic. Nevertheless, with ongoing inflammation and remodeling, the myopathic atria become manifest in the form of atrial fibrillation and stroke to typically draw clinical attention. Atrial fibrillation leads to a thrombotic state that feeds back to cause more atrial fibrillation by facilitating atrial fibrosis and inflammation. Furthermore, the development of an atrial myopathy not only leads to atrial fibrillation, but also contributes to pulmonary venous hypertension and systemic thromboembolism. In this context, the term thromboinflammation is often used. Thromboinflammation is also an important aspect during adverse ventricular remodeling and heart failure. Cardiac fibrosis is regulated by the coagulation pathway, which is well known for maintaining hemostasis through the coagulation cascade. Despite its role in maintaining hemostasis, the coagulation plays a significant role in the subsequent healing response by orchestrating inflammation and fiber proliferation. Importantly, coagulation does not only become activated in damaged blood vessels, but can also act in other cardiac cell types. Upon cardiac injury, endothelial leakage results in the accumulation of coagulation factors in the myocardial tissue, which then become activated by tissue factor expressed on cardiac cells, where it initiates downstream signaling and cardiac remodeling. Coagulation-induced regulation of cardiac remodeling is mediated through the family of protease activated receptors, consisting of four G protein coupled receptors, of which the thrombin uh, receptor PAR1 has been described as the most abundantly expressed G protein coupled receptor in cardiac fibroblasts. We assessed a small cohort of patients with HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and atrial fibrillation that received stable anticoagulation by either receiving a vitamin K antagonist or non-vitamin K antagonist or anticoagulant NOAC and found that NOAC treatment resulted in improved diastolic, uh, improved diastolic function, reduced plasma levels of collagen production, in, uh, increased degraded collagen fragments, and reduced PAR1 and PAR2 expression in circulating antigen-presenting cells compared with patients treated with classical vitamin K antagonists. NOACs inhibit PAR-mediated signaling and have therefore been speculated to be superior to classical vitamin K antagonists, especially in patients in which cardiac fibrosis and remodeling is present. We evaluate the effect of PAR1 inhibition in a metabolic disease model of FOE knockout mice fed with a Western type diet, a four month treatment period with a specific PAR1 inhibitor of Vorapaxar, decreased cardiac collagen deposition by 44%, and reduced cardiac inflammatory cell infiltration and TGF beta plasma levels further confirm the therapeutic potential of PAR1 inhibition. We have recently demonstrated that the treatment with this specific PAR1 antagonist Vorapaxar also reduced arteriosclerosis and especially CD8 T cell associated inflammation. Two recent studies emphasize the role of activated cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells in cardiovascular disease. The Optico ACS trial from our department found that CD8 positive T cells and their effector molecules are involved in erosion of coronary plaques during acute coronary syndrome. Teresa Gerd from the Collision Scientist Program is still working on this very important project. 
cytotoxic T cells also mediate the adverse cardiac remodeling post myocardial infarction. Peripheral T cell activation has been de described in patients with atrial fibrillation, and T cells infiltrate the left atrial tissue, as shown here. Unfortunately, these studies did no further phenotype. Atrial fibrillation and this contrast with atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery is a progressive disease. You have a subclinical onset and depending to the degree of structural changes, sooner or later atrial fibrillation becomes clinically evident. Studies which describe the immunological phenotype in patients with atrial fibrillation were mostly obtained, uh, obtained during the chronic phase of the disease. Therefore, we conducted an observational study at the earliest time point when the cardiologist get in contact with these patients. This happens when patients experience their first symptomatic, mostly tachycardic episode of atrial fibrillation. Patients without atrial fibrillation, but with a comparable high cardiovascular risk surface controls. So at this time point, first clinical presentation, the immune phenotype of patients with atrial fibrillation is characterized by an activation of cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. We found, higher, uh, we found higher circulating levels of classical inflammatory CD8 T cell associated cytokines like granulizin, granzyme, but also TNF and interferon. The number of activated cytotoxic T cells increase. And we also tested their potential to release TNF or interferon, for instance, after polyclonal stimulation, as you can see. And just to give you an impression, the percentage of activated CD8 positive T cells positively correlates with a decree of atrial myopathy and increased left atrial volume, higher levels of atrial natriuretic peptide and increased cardiac fibrosis are typical markers. Since we also found elevated levels of biomarker that indicate an inferior activation, it is likely that activated cytotoxic cells infiltrate the left atrium, immediate the progression of atrial remodeling, and maybe the initiation of clinically significant atrial fibrillation. An interesting concept on how activation of peripheral cytotoxic T cells can be achieved has been discovered in patients with HIV infection. Intestinal barrier uh, dysfunction the leaky gut concept and microbial translocations implicated in systemic CD8 T cell activation associated with HIV infection and a CD4 lymphocytopenia, providing evidence that circulating endotoxin or other microbial products may contribute to systemic immune activation. During first clinical presentation, we found that patients with atrial fibrillation have elevated circulating levels of biomarker of intestinal inflammation and barrier disturbance. This is associated with an increased microbial translocation as indicated by higher levels of LPS, LPS binding protein, SCD4, for instance. Since there is an elevation and no consumption of endotoxin core antibodies during early atrial fibrillation, we assume that the low-grade endotoxemia is rather chronic than acute. Next, we will focus on trying to find a connection of intestinal barrier dysfunction, microbial translocation, CD8 T cell activation in patients with atrial fibrillation, especially how these mechanisms contribute to atrial electrical and structural remodeling. But we are totally aware that this might be only one explanation. Anyway, with this kind of sampling, we are missing this whole subclinical phase. So we end up here again with prospective cohort studies. And just to give you an impression, and one example is all about atrial myopathy. All studies that had a similar approach found that especially marker of inferior activation, thromboinflammation, and cardiac remodeling are associated with the risk of new onset atrial fibrillation. So we are just as smart as before because from these data, we have no information about the underlying pathomechanisms that lead to atrial myopathy itself that later triggers the elevation of anti p for instance. The elevation of natriuretic peptides is only an indicator of atrial myopathy. To overcome these limitations, we are now going back to different adipidine small animal models to test our hypothesis that uh, intestinal barrier dysfunction, microbial translocation, CD8 T cell activation, mediates atrial myopathy and atrial fibrillation. Of course, everyone who is much into cardiac electrophysiology knows that you need large animal models to induce atrial fibrillation, but this is just the beginning. BELAV would be a very interesting perspective cohort, for instance, because BELAV is an uh, observational clinical cohort study of patients with existing cardiovascular disease. And the 
this makes it more likely that these patients will develop atrial fibrillation. And during our discussion with Ben, it became clear that patients who develop atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery might be an interesting study population because you have a clear onset and a relatively controlled setting. The tight case study, for instance, is still recruiting also the or will be recruiting at the Deutsche Herz Zentrum and prospectively evaluates the potential of high normal potassium levels to prevent new onset atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery and might therefore be an interesting platform to study T cell dependent immunopathogenesis in patients with atrial fibrillation. I would like to thank the BIH, especially, especially Duska Dragoon, my mentors, the colleagues from our and our collaborating labs, and the DZHK. DGK and Deutsche Herz Stiftung for funding this project and you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, the stage is open for discussion and it's a pleasure. So we have a very active uh, community of people who are listening to us. So we have had a number of questions. I think the first question probably goes to Benjamin. Um, how does the use of beta blockers affect the use of cardiacular mines? Asked uh, Timo Nazari. Yeah, great question. And of course shows clinical insight. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to the introduction of beta blockers early after cardiac surgery uh, is of course the, the ongoing treatment uh, with inotropes. Uh, there was also a barrier where noradrenaline use, so vasopressors, were often perceived as a uh, contraindication for beta blockers. Uh, and we've actually just defined a threshold below which uh, the giving of beta blockers can be concomitant with vasopressors such as noradrenaline and didn't find any adverse effect of that at all. Uh, after a good perioperative care, very few patients uh, after elective cabbage surgery will actually need inotropes. So it will be a small proportion of patients that uh, cannot be treated um, because of that. Interestingly, the, you know, we as cardiac intensivists, we often sneered about uh, you know, cardiac surgeons who give frusamide to the failing kidney, uh, basically saying the poor kidney is struggling, why do you just hit it harder? Uh, but then we of course turn around and do exactly the same with the heart where a heart that is clearly struggling, and I see AFAX very much as a general sign of cardiac unhappiness, and then we go ahead and drive it harder with catecholamines, um, and maybe there is an overall benefit of actually doing less of that, or more akin to heart failure, beta blocking patients early uh, for many reasons. Of course, cardiac output needs to be maintained, mean arterial pressure needs to be maintained, and other organs can't suffer. Thank you so much. So uh, directly the next question goes in the direction uh, from Christian Lücht. Um, following on the efficacy of catecholamines, mines, did you investigate hard endpoints like patient survival? <laughs> well, many have tried, including us, and many have failed. Uh, it's un incredibly un difficult to actually untangle uh, the cause and effect um, of AF on not just morbidity, but also mortality. Uh, we actually wrote an editorial about this not too long ago. Um, the, the cause of death for patients after cardiac surgery uh, often manifests through other organ uh, failure, such as you know, renal failure, respiratory failure, or indeed cardiovascular collapse. I, it, it, it's definitely an area of research that is hugely important as we talk about uh, value-based healthcare problems, you know, outcomes that ma matter to patients. I don't think we will get to the point soon that we can link AFAX with survival. We, we are getting closer to managing endpoints such as uh, alive and out of hospital at 60 days or at 30 days. Those are endpoints that increasingly find entry into clinical studies into AFAX, quite rightly so but untangling the intricacy of cause of death and AFAX, uh, I, I think still escapes and eludes us. Thank you. Further clinical direction and Julia, no worries. We will come to your questions for you as well. Um, so question by Marcus Kelm. Uh, AF might, might be underdiagnosed before cardiac surgery. 
and then be detected in the perioperative setting? Would you see applications for reliable uh, before admission or and or after discharges? So monitoring AF before and after is the question, I guess. So great question and one that will make my, my good friend and collaborator Danny Mühlschlegel in Boston very happy because that is verbatim the study that he's just proposed and I believe we'll hear whether he got it funded uh, uh, very soon. So that is an important question. Uh, we are obviously through type K hoping to also shed some light on the other end of the spectrum because I've got no doubt that there is a lot of undiagnosed post-operative AF which will also be important to really understand the impact that it's having. And through the 120 hour continuous heart rate monitoring that we have in these study patients, uh, comparing that to clinically detected AF, we're hoping to understand that side of the coin a bit better. But Danny Mühlschlegel in Boston is trying to understand the pre-op uh, burden of undiagnosed AF before cardiac surgery. Thank you. I Thank you. I think the next question can go to Julian, uh, because it's starting off now to turn the question turn to go to this atrial myopathy. Uh, so um, are there echocardiographic uh, criteria such as atrial size that can be predict remodeling of prior to cardiac surgery and therefore correlate when the risk of atrial fibrillation occurs? So the question, I guess, is it's coming from Timo Nazari. The question is, uh, can you predict cardiac uh, atrial myopathy prior to surgery, Julian? Um, yes, from a cardiologist point of view, you can easily detect atrial myopathy, uh, for example, by MRI or by a normal easy to uh, echo uh, that is easy to perform. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, and I also mentioned the um, atrium that is enlarged. This is a very important indicator, but also you can use uh, biomarkers like the atrial uh, natriuretic peptides or NT pro, uh, pro BNP, for instance. But as far as I know, there are no studies that have uh, for this connection to um, uh, atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery. Ben, maybe, uh, do you know any uh, studies in this direction? Uh, none that have been adequately powered. So there is anecdotal evidence. We obviously know that atrial dilatation, so sheer atrial size, which is a very coarse measure that does routinely get uh, looked at preoperatively, does correlate with the incidence of AFAX. But uh, the actual morphology of atrial tissue is something that hasn't been investigated uh, in depth enough yet. Thank you. So Julian, now you get your question directly from your scientific advisors. Uh, so Britta Siegmund is asking, do you think it is just about the production of, I'm sorry, losing it. Do you think it's just about the production of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines and then a therapy such as interleukin 1RA Cantor's trial would be sufficient? Or do you think that this is driven by an antigen specific possible microbiota driven T cells? Yeah, that, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, a CD8 uh, T cell directed therapy is a very interesting approach, but in my opinion, we should focus on already existing pharmacological investigation uh, interventions to mute inflammation in general and not uh, on single pathways thereby targeting adverse atrial structure and re uh, electrical remodeling. Cantors, uh, as already mentioned, and Colcott, for instance, have been promising trials for, uh, in this direction. But also NOACs or direct PAR1 inhibitors like Vorpaxar also show promising anti-inflammatory pleiotropic effects and th therefore should be evaluated for their potential to uh, target CD8-mediated me uh, uh, inflammation, yes. Thank you. Another question going now, starting with the microbial uh, translocation, it coming again from Timo Nasari. Do you also look at the dysbiosis in patients prior to cardiac surgery? And do you think that this could impact on the outcome? Uh, unfortunately, at this small observation study, we don't have had the ability to get two samples. So we have no information about dysbiosis, but I think and I'm convinced that there is a kind of dysbiosis that uh, uh, 
mediates or supports this uh, kind of inflammation and uh, leaky gut uh, and supports this leaky gut concept. But, but I think in uh, further trials, we have to go in this direction and uh, do analyze uh, in this direction, yeah. Thank you. I would like to round up the discussion with the last question coming from Isabella Häuser. Uh, first of all, thanks for the interesting talk This everyone is saying, and it's totally true to both of you. So the question is regarding the BLOF cohort, how do you check for atrial fibrillations during the observation period using Apple Watch, using wearables? So what is the, what is the idea there? How to follow up on the longitudinal scale? Maybe so, uh, then? Oh. I, I think Julian, Julian go ahead. is to answer uh, questions about BLOVE. I, I have read about it now because it is a hugely interesting endeavor and, and definitely something I would like to uh, you know, gain access to data or contribute to in any way I can, <clears throat> I can. But the actual mechanics of surveillance for AF within that cohort, I don't know, Julian, is that something you know in detail? Uh, unfortunately not. I just wanted to uh, introduce this topic and maybe discuss it with the uh, beloved investigators to, uh, yeah, to have a look on this uh, specific uh, topic in the beloved study. But I don't know so far uh, how do they monitor uh, their patients uh, during the, during the follow-up. So thank you, Ben. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone, for the discussion. And uh, it's my pleasure to hand over now for the second part of this session to Gunnar Lachmann. Thank you, Silke. I've got the pleasure to introduce our next tandem, Professor Bimba Heuer and Dr. Eva Schretzenmeier. Professor Bimba Heuer finished the habilitation at the Charité in 2015, before she became head of rheumatology at the University Medical Center Schleswig-Holstein in 2017. Dr. Eva Schretzenmeier is resident at the Medical Department, Division of Nephrology and Internal Intensive Care Medicine at the Charité and Clinician Scientist since 2019. Both share an expertise in characterization and differentiation of plasma cells, and I'm now very much looking forward to your presentations. Sorry for taking a moment longer. I hope that it works now. Um, it's my great pleasure to talk here today at that symposium. I obviously met Dushka Dragoon at my time at the Charité. I spent 15 years working and researching at the Charité, and obviously our paths has crossed in that time. And uh, so it's a great honor to, to have been asked to present at this meeting. And it's also a great pleasure to present in tandem with Eva Schwetzenmeier a young and upcoming scientist um, who is working on a very similar field um, as I am. And she's working with my former colleagues at the Charité. So it's a great pleasure to do that tandem together with her. So my talk will be sort of an introduction to her talk and uh, some of our own research results from the first years here in Kiel now. So um, I'm talking about B cell memory and autoimmunity and infection. And I think that links both both our talks really nicely together. So uh, why do we have to care about B cells in autoimmunity and also in the context of infection and vaccination? So if you look at this scheme, you will see that the activated B cells, they become plasma blasts after contact um, in the spleen and the lymph node, and then we can find them in the blood. And some of them will reach the bone marrow or the inflamed tissue where they find a so-called survival niche and become long-lived there. And um, that is rather independent of the specificity of the cell. If the cells don't find that survival niche, they will die. And um, this is the concept that most of us actually learned in med school, that plasma cells only live for about two weeks and then they die and then they are gone. And that would mean that they only play a role in the acute phase of um, infection. But what we could show in the past years, and um, this is why this is actually important because uh, we were already sure that plasma cells must live longer because if you look at the half-life of certain antibodies after vaccination, as for example, vaccinia or measles, 
you will see that, for example, the antibodies against measles do have a half-life of about 3,000 years, and that cannot be explained with the half-life of uh, 14 days of a plasma cell or the half-life of an antibody, which is um, approximately the same. So there needed to be an explanation for that. And this is what I did actually during my um, PhD thesis at the Charité and at the Deutsches Räumer Forschungszentrum. So what we did is uh, we took a mouse model for systemic autoimmunity, the so-called NZBW mouse, which is a mouse that gets something that looks a bit like systemic lupus erythematosus. And uh, we fed those mice with the cymidine analogon that is incorporated into the DNA of proliferating cells. And if you give that to the mouse continuously for about 12 weeks, you will have a population of cells that incorporated the BRDU. These are cells that, um, that um, uh, proliferated in that time frame, so in those 12 weeks. And these are short-lived plasma blasts. And then you will have another population of about 40% of the plasma cells that did not incorporate the BRDU in that time frame. So we are sure that these cells were um, established before the 12 weeks and did not further proliferate. So we are pretty sure that these cells are long-lived plasma cells. And um, these cells do have an importance also in, in autoimmunity because when we treat the mice with cyclophosphamide, a drug that we uh, routinely also use in the clinics, you can nicely see here that the short-lived plasma cells more or less disappear, whereas the long-lived plasma cells remain more or less untouched. And as we wanted to be sure that these cells are really important for autoimmunity, we actually transfer them into a mouse that does not have an own immune system and check the kidneys of those mice. And what you can see here is the uppermost picture is the glomerulus of a normal NZBW mouse, so the lupus mouse model, which has a nice glomerulonephritis. And then you have the picture of the mouse that um, received the plasma blasts of an NZBW mice and also developed glomerulonephritis and the control mice that did not develop the disease. And we also found proteinuria in the transferred mice. So for us, that was the proof that we actually have to take care about these long-lived plasma cells in autoimmunity, and which is quite nice, is that this concept um, is developing further. So this is data um, also still with my former colleagues from Berlin, where we are now trying to selectively deplete the plasma cells in order to keep the protective ones. And um, there are already some approaches to target the long-lived cells, but with not sparing the protective ones, there's a rather recent publication uh, where an antibody that is directed more or less selectively against plasma cells was used in lupus. But it's not something that is limited to rheumatology or lupus, but um, there is also data from the Department of Nephrology also in Berlin where this approach has been used in order to uh, treat um, humoral rejection of transplants. In addition to the long-lived plasma cells, what we observe in those patients is a population of short-lived plasma blasts. And this is a picture, fax picture of the healthy control. So you can see in the um, left picture, you see the normal B cells and the distribution of the um, different B cell populations. And then you have this picture of the plasma cell population that is normally around 1% of all B cells in the peripheral blood. So if you would take your blood, we will probably find around about 1% of plasma cells. So if we now go into the different autoimmune diseases, and this is um, just three examples, um, a patient with a rare vasculitis, another patient with a small vessel vasculitis that is a bit more frequent and with lupus. And you can see that all those patients, once they are flaring, so if the disease is really active, they have this expansion of their plasma blast population in the blood and probably also the niches in the bone marrow and in the inflamed tissue are filled with more pathogenic long-lived plasma cells. And um, we were really curious because that's something that we observe also after tetanus vaccination and also after influenza vaccination, 
whether the same holds true in COVID-19. So what we did is when we had the first um, COVID-19 patients in Kiel, and as you probably know, Schleswig-Holstein had a lot less COVID-19 patients um, than, for example, Berlin. So we had some difficulties in doing COVID-19 research, but still, we also had those patients. And this is one patient from our ICU department where we um, uh, checked for the plasma cell population longitudinally uh, during the stay in the ward. And as you can see, this patient has a really massive plasma cell expansion with about 60% of all the B cells in the blood being plasma cells which made us obviously curious of uh, what is going on in those patients. And um, what was also very interesting is that we found on the one hand mature plasma cells in the blood of those COVID-19 patients, especially in the ones with the acute infection and also in the patients with mild infection. But when the patients recover, those mature plasma cells disappear from the blood. And usually we only find mature plasma cells in the blood when they are kicked out of the bone marrow where they usually reside. So that was a very interesting finding. And as you can see, we compared that to healthy controls and also patients with autoimmune diseases. And we don't find that same pattern in the patients with autoimmune diseases or in healthy controls. And we also found a huge um, proportion of highly activated plasma blasts, which is something that we obviously would expect in a patient with an acute infection. So that was also a very interesting finding in those patients with um, acute COVID-19. And then obviously, I mean, everybody's talking about vaccination and as someone being interested in plasma cells, uh, we were interested in what is happening in immunizations in patients with rheumatic diseases. And what we did at the beginning of the year when Schleswig-Holstein started to um, immunize the first uh, priority groups with, um, against COVID-19. So we took 13 patients with different immunosuppressive drugs that um, they receive for either rheumatological drugs or psoriasis or chronic inflammatory bowel disease. And um, we checked their antibody response to that vaccine. And this is what you can see on the left panel. You see the IgG response. And you can see, yes, we did have one patient that did not respond at all according to the IgG response. That is a patient who, re who received a B cell depleting agent. But all, all the other patients did respond, some a bit lower than the healthy controls, but all patients developed an antibody titer. And the same holds true for neutralize, neutralizing antibodies. So that was um, a good message for at least our patient population. And meanwhile, we also have some T cell data. So we know that even the patient that did not develop any antibodies at least developed the T cell response. So at least for patients in rheumatology, we do feel that um, the patients all um, are able to mount an antibody response, even if it might be less than the healthy controls, but even a bit of protection is obviously better than no protection at all. And then we were obviously interested, uh, well, this is um, another picture. So we also checked whether we find again that plasma cell population after the vaccination. And um, this is a picture from um, before the second vaccination on the left, and then after the second vaccination, and this is all mRNA vaccines um, by BioNTech the patients receive. And we do see an expansion of the plasma cells in the blood of those patients um, after the vaccination. And we were also able to show that at least a fraction of that plasma cell population is um, spike-specific plasma cells, so really uh, plasma cells that were created in the context of that immunization. And the good message for our patient was, in addition, that we didn't see any flares of the underlying disease, which was one of the big concerns of our patient population, that if they would get that vaccine, they would experience flares of their disease, and we didn't see any in our population. So that was a very good news. And uh, we're still continuing to work on that. We still have uh, tons of data available from those patients that we're still analyzing because it was so much in the beginning of the year that we did not manage to analyze all of that till now. So that work is still ongoing.
And with that, I would like to finish my part of the presentation. So I hope that I could show you that tumor memory is generated by short-lived plasma blasts and long-lived plasma cells. Both cell types are relevant in immune reactions, in autoimmunity, infection, as well as in vaccine response. In autoimmunity and the situation, for example, of humoral rejection, long-lived plasma cells represent a therapeutic challenge that we're still working on and have not yet managed to solve. And in the context of infection and vaccination, they are the source of long-lasting humoral protection, even in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases. And obviously, this is work that I didn't do alone. A lot of that was done in uh, my former group at the Charité, together with Andreas Radbrook and Falk Hiepe, and a lot of collaborators at um, both the rheumatology department and the DRFZ, and obviously also now continued with a lot of those people and um, Eva Schretzenmeier. And um, all the new data was done by my working group here in Kiel, um, and a lot of that by Ulf Geisen and Ina Martens, and in collaboration with people from the Department of Dermatology and Gastroenterology. And with that, I would like to hand over to Eva for her presentation. Thank you, Bimba, for the nice introduction and your very nice talk. I will just continue where uh, you stopped. Today, in honor to Duska, I decided to present data on the patient population she was mostly interested in. So I'm talking uh, about uh, the vaccine response to new mRNA vaccine in kidney transplant recipients and also in dialysis patients. So since the beginning of the year, we are able to vaccinate against COVID-19 and there has been already a lot of data how these uh, patient populations of uh, dialysis dependent CKD patients and kidney transplant recipients respond to the vaccine. We were quite afraid that our dialysis patients do not respond well because we know that from hepatitis B vaccination or influenza that we need to vaccinate them either with very high initial doses or they need to get several additional boosters. We were quite surprised when we saw that the dialysis patients do re respond quite well. Most of the patients, over 90%, have a zero conversion after two vaccination of an mRNA vaccine. Although the neutralization capacity and the titers of the IgG and IgA directed against the S1 protein are still a little bit lower um, than in comparable um, populations, but this might still mean protection. This looks very different in the kidney transplant recipients. Here is shown the work of Boyaski et al. He's from the group of Doris Zegev, who presented his data yesterday together with uh, Marcel Naik. In the kidney transplant recipients, only about half of the patients have measurable but very low antibody titers after two doses of the mRNA vaccine. We were also interested how kidney transplant recipients and dia dialysis patients respond to the vaccine. And we were not only interested in antibodies, but we were also interested in cellular compartments, especially from my side in B and plasma cell development. So we investigated healthy controls, young healthcare workers and also elderly patients, 40 kidney transplant recipients and 44 dialysis patients after two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And we did that seven days after the second boost because this is usually the day where you find plasma blasts in the periphery. We did another follow-up three to four weeks uh, after the boost to control antibody titers again. So what we found in our cohort was that we only had four patients who either developed IgG or IgA directed against the S1 protein, while also the dialysis patients did quite well. All of them developed neutralizing antibodies, um, but they were lower than in the healthy controls. So in terms of our cohort, I have to um, say that 
all of our patients, so almost all 39 of the uh, 40 patients were on an anti-metabolite treatment, so mycophenolate or azathioprine. And this is m maybe one of the main determinators of antibody response. We then did the follow-up three to four weeks after the second vaccination, and we saw that the dialysis patients still have some increase in uh, the antibody levels. They get higher IgGs and the neutralization capacity still increase. In kidney transplant recipients, if you don't see something at day seven, they also did not develop um, antibodies over time. So then we looked at the B-cell subset of these patients, because as Bimba mentioned, one, uh, of course, to develop antibodies, you need B-cells, and it is already described that dialysis patients and kidney transplant recipients, due to the anti-metabolites and a broad immunosuppressive treatment, they have diminished numbers of absolute B-cells, and this is also what we found. The kidney transplant recipients do have a reduction of absolute numbers of B-cells, while the distribution in the different subsets, like plasma plus pre, prost, and naive B cells, is only different for an increase in naive B cells in the kidney transplant recipients, and the other compartments are quite unchanged. We then also looked at the isotypes uh, of uh, these B cells, and we found that the healthy controls have more IgG positive uh, B cells, so larger or further developed in their switching process than the kidney transplant recipients um, who had uh, mainly non-IgA, non-IgG, so IgM uh, plasma cells. The rest of the compartments did not have uh, yeah, major differences. We then established a staining for RBD specific. This is the receptor binding domain of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, and this is part of all the uh, vaccines that are currently um, yeah, available. And we do this with a double staining technique, uh, two different fluorophores, AF48, and AF647 are stably coupled uh, to the RBD protein, and then we stain with both of the colors, um, and um, the double positive cells are considered antigen specific. This reaction uh, is blockable, and uh, we also confirmed the uh, specificity of uh, these cells by uh, single cell uh, RNA uh, sequencing or BCR sequencing, since we found sequencing sequences that have been previously uh, published um, among these RBD-specific uh, B cells. What we then saw is that the healthy controls especially display an increase in absolute RBD-positive B cells, while among KTR this uh, increase was also uh, present, but uh, not as prominent as among the healthy uh, controls. When you then look at what are these antigen-specific B cells, um, like the difference become, differences become very clear. In the healthy controls, a large proportion are plasma blasts, as we would uh, expect it, and uh, another large uh, proportion are post-switched memory B cells. So as in a classical vaccine response. In the kidney transplant recipients, the plasma blast, the antigen-specific plasma blast, are completely lacking, and also the post-switched uh, memory B cells. So when we then plot this as a TISNE plot, this becomes even more evident that uh, the kidney transplant recipients, this is a TISNE plot of all the RBD-specific uh, B cells from all the donors uh, we investigated, and you see with the CD27, CD38, IgG, so the typical uh, expression pattern of antigens or of plasma blast, the kidney transplant recipients don't have them, while in the dialysis patients, according to uh, their response, uh, we see some antigen-specific plasma cells. The isotype was also yeah, different in these uh, few cells, with uh, healthy controls having uh, more IgG-positive cells. We then correlated this with all the parameters we have, and uh, it has been previously uh, described that the neut this uh, neutralization capacity 
capacity correlates well with the IgG and IgA levels, but also interestingly, the zero response correlates with the presence of peripheral plasma blasts. And so we, yeah, this is just another depiction of basically the same data. So if you have a low neutralization capacity and are below the cutoff for positivity, you also have fewer plasma plus uh, fewer RBD-specific B cells in total and uh, fewer post-switch B cells in relative and abs absolute uh, numbers. For, uh, for kidney transplant recipients, we were able to uh, gain data from single cell RNA sequencing and we sorted activated T cells um, and uh, HLA-DR uh, CD38 positive uh, uh, T cells, sorry, plasma blast and memory B cells. And uh, we did this of two, and among these uh, four patients, we had um, the possibility to investigate also one individual, one of the individuals who responded. And uh, so we had three non responders and one responder. We then found different clusters, and uh, we had yeah, prominent differences in these clusters. So one difference was the cluster five. Uh, these were the T cells, granzyme positive T cells, which were different, and of course the plasma cells again that differed. Uh, that were different between the responder and the non-responder. So, in summary, I want to um, I want to say that the zero response to the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine is delayed in the dialysis patients and markedly reduced in the kidney transplant recipients. The majority of antigen-specific B cells were identified in the plasma blast or post-switch memory B cell compartments in the healthy controls. In the kidney transplant recipients and dialysis patients, they were mainly naive or pre-switched. And um, the kidney transplant recipients uh, showed a yeah, diminishing of this TCF7, CD27 positive, granzyme positive T cells and plasma blast. So our data indicate that a lack, lack maybe of T cell help um, related to the immunosuppressions of kidney transplant recipients results in an impaired germinal center differentiation of B and plasma cells. And of course, since our patients obviously do not have uh, protection from the vaccine since we also see severe cases of COVID-19 in kidney transplant recipients after two doses of the vaccines. We are looking for optimized vaccination protocols and the easiest of course is to revaccinate um, the people and the patients. And we're currently doing uh, that and uh, see some, uh, let's say, promising result that this will improve, uh, improve the response. So I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, of course, uh, the BIH team, Duska, for the initiation of uh, this program Without this, all of this work and uh, my career wouldn't have uh, been possible. And uh, for this project, uh, my supervisors, uh, Professor Dörner and Professor Eckhart, and uh, all the also general uh, physicians who included the patients and uh, made them participate in our study. So I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you very much for these excellent presentations. We have several questions from the audience. The first question is from Britta Siegmund to Bimba. She says that in the IBD population data from the UK, these indicate that the serological responses after COVID infection is attenuated in patients under anti-TNF-alpha treatments. And here in particular in patients in combo therapy based on Kennedy 2000, in 21. And now the question, Bimba, in your eyes, has this consequences for the vaccination strategy? Well, obviously, um, that's an interesting question. And we only had a tiny uh, fraction of IBD patients in um, our 
cohort after the vaccination, but um, we will continue to follow them up because one idea is, so the patients we did include, there was one on infliximab as well, um, but not on a combo therapy, and the other ones were not on infliximab, but I think that's, that's something that we have to look in, and um, my feeling is that um, there might be a reduced um, effect of the vaccine and also of the immunization after infection and um, that it might disappear faster so that the half-life of the antibodies and of the plasma cells might be um, reduced as compared to healthy controls. So this is what, something that we want to look into and that we will follow up and uh, probably will be able to answer that question in the next weeks or months. Okay, thank you. Another question is from Dominic Miller. Do you have or do you know any data how the B cell and antibody responses happens in the AstraZeneca population in comparison to the mRNA vaccination scheme? I can. Um... So in the kidney transplant recipients, we also do not uh, see a response to AstraZeneca. Um, this is actually quite the same. We first thought so because um, in the healthy controls, we see much larger development of uh, plasma cells. So they have up to 30% of uh, plasma blasts. So on this day seven after second vaccine. Um, but I would say the first uh, 30 patients that I'm looking at uh, right now also do not show a better antibody response. The idea, of course, for this revaccination study was that we do a heterologous boost with the AstraZeneca also under the idea um, that this induces a stronger T cell uh, help and leads to more uh, B and uh, plasma cells and in, in, as a consequence then also antibodies. Okay, thank you. Next question is for the transplant population. What is the contribu contribution of the immunosuppressive therapy thereon? Um, so in this uh, data from the Dori Zegev group, we saw that the, maybe the main determinator is uh, the dosing or the amount of anti-metabolites in their immunosuppressions. And I think this is also true for uh, lupus patients or other autoimmune disease patients. Um, we I only investigated a few SLE patients, since this is also a focus uh, of our group, and there we also see that this might be the main determinator. So some, someone on two grams of cell um did not show a response. So the other idea, of course, uh, would be uh, to reduce the mycophenolate, which can be done um, in a stable transplant uh, recipients without the presence of donor-specific antibodies. This has previously been proven to be uh, safe and this would be one of the next concepts in optimization of the, um, of the vaccination protocol to give them a break of MMF. And of course, this should be under uh, monitoring of, uh, we can here, measure the exposure to MPA by uh, EMPDH or um, and monitoring of HLA antibodies. Thank you again, Eva. Another question from Victor Corman. Why should antibody development presence in blood play a relevant role, relevant role in protection for severe COVID-19 as antibodies do not play a major role in other respiratory viruses, including the four endemic coronavirus, coronaviruses. <laughs> okay, good question. I think we uh, had this uh, discussion before if they should, uh, uh, if antibodies play a protective role. I think there is already uh, data on that in a, I think, Nature paper published uh, one or two weeks ago and also in the yeah, reinfection in previously infected, there one main discriminator between being reinfected and being not reinfected was the presence of antibodies. And I think the other is just clinical experience. We saw now 
severe cases of COVID-19. We now have uh, one patient on the, on the ICU uh, on the ventilator who had two vaccines and she had a good T cell response but no antibodies. So um, I think this is why we uh, think that antibodies are a measure of protection. I can also only underline that because that's what we see and obviously it's important to measure both sides because for the moment we don't know the cut off from which antibody level on we can call the patient immune but um, I think all the data that is available now um, um, yeah, indicates that the antibodies play a very important role with the t-cell side obviously also being important but um, the antibodies playing a more important role. Okay, so one of the last question from Dominic Müller. He was wondering about the first AstraZeneca vaccination and thereafter BioNTech. So I guess about the immunological roles in the antibody responses. Well, I don't know if I, whether you want to answer that question. I mean, there has been just a, a publication coming out from, I think it's a working group in Madrid that showed that um, the heterologous immunization with uh, having AstraZeneca as the first immunization and then BioNTech as the second one leads to a more pronounced um, immune reaction and higher levels of antibodies um, as compared to AstraZeneca in both vaccinations. So that would be also a argument in favor of um, the scheme that if I propose to immunize the patients with both vaccines, because obviously it, it, it apparently leads to a stronger immune reaction than um, the vaccination with either BioNTech twice or AstraZeneca twice. I do not see any further question. So before we come to the lunch break, I would like to remind you of the memorial room for Dushka and also for the digital networking tables. And then again, I would like to thank you all for your participation and hope you all enjoy the rest of this symposium. Thank you very much. I, I think with this, we go now to the lunch break, right? Yeah, so thanks to everyone also from my side. And I think with this, we, we go now to the lunch break and meet again in the networking area.